In wartime, Winston Churchill once said, Truth is so precious that she should always be attended by a bodyguard of lies. Secrecy is key to any successful military operation, for even the strongest army, most advanced weapons, or most brilliant plan are utterly worthless if the enemy knows you're coming. But maintaining said secrecy is easier said than done. Military operations are complex affairs, often involving tens or even hundreds of thousands of personnel. One slip of the tongue, one misplaced document, one lapse in vigilance can easily cause an entire plan to unravel, turning a victory into a costly disaster. Imagine then the gargantuan task facing Allied intelligence in the lead up to Operation Overlord, the 1944 invasion of Nazi occupied France, and the largest seaborne landing in history. To hide the location and date of the landings from the Germans, Allied intelligence carried out a massive deception operation codenamed appropriately Bodyguard, which involved everything from double agents to false radio traffic to entire English fields covered in inflatable tanks and wooden aeroplanes. Yet, despite these meticulous measures, in May 1944, the whole operation was nearly blown via the most unexpected of mediums a crossword puzzle. This is the story of perhaps the strangest security breach in military history. On the 18th of August 1942, a seemingly innocuous clue appeared in the crossword of the Daily Telegraph newspaper, French Port, six letters. But the answer, Dieppe, proved to be anything but. For early the next morning, Canadian, British and American forces launched Operation Jubilee, an attempt to capture the French port city of Dieppe. The raid was a disaster. The Germans, tipped off by a freak encounter between the Allied ships and German torpedo boats, were already on high alert and raked the beaches with withering machine gun and mortar fire. Tanks struggled to advance up the loose shingle, only to find themselves trapped by the seawall and picked off one by one. After less than six hours, more than half of the raiding force had either been killed or captured and the remaining forces withdrew from the beach. Fearing that a spy had tipped off the Germans about the raid through the Daily Telegraph crossword, the British Military Intelligence Service, MI5, dispatched John Norman Buchan, 2nd Lord Tweedsmuir, to investigate. A senior intelligence officer attached to the Canadian Army, Tweedsmuir was the son of author John Buchan, known for his spy thrillers such as 1915's The 39 Steps. However, he failed to uncover any crossword-loving German spy rings, concluding that, quote, We noticed that the crossword contained the word Dieppe, and there was an immediate and exhaustive of inquiry, which also involved MI5, but in the end it was concluded that it was just a remarkable coincidence, a complete fluke. Indeed, it was reason that had a spy wanted to tip off the Germans to the Dieppe raid, they would have done so much earlier than the day before the raid. There the matter might have rested, becoming the most minor of minor footnotes in the history of the Second World War. Then, two years later, MI5 noticed another, even more disconcerting pattern in the Telegraph's crossword clues. The May 2nd, 1944 puzzle contains the clue 17 across, one of the US, four letters. While the May 22nd puzzle included three down, Red Indian on the Missouri, five letters. This was followed up on May the 27th by 11 across, but some bigwig like this has stolen some of it at times. Eight letters. On May the 30th by 11 across, this bush is a center of nursery revolutions, eight letters. And finally, on June the 1st by 15 down, Britannia and he hold the same thing, seven letters. The answer, Utah, Omaha, Overlord, Mulberry, and Neptune, might have seemed innocuous to the average crossword enthusiast, but to MI5, they rang major alarm bells, for they all happened to be code words associated with the upcoming Allied invasion of Europe. Overlord for the entire operation, Neptune for the label landings, Utah and Omaha for the beaches where the American forces would land, and Mulberry for a specially designed artificial harbor the Allies would construct on the landing beaches. Other associated keywords, such as Gold, Sword, and Juno for the British and Canadian landing beaches, had also appeared in previous Telegraph crossword puzzles, but these were common crossword clues and were dismissed as mere coincidences. The May to June series, however, was too uncanny to ignore. Was a spy leaking secret information about the upcoming invasion via the crossword? If so, it would have been a serious breach indeed, for as far as British intelligence was concerned, there were no German spies in the UK. Since 1940, every spy the Germans had sent to the British Isles had been arrested and turned against their former masters in an elaborate counterintelligence operation known as Double Cross. Furthermore, MI5 had good reasons to distrust crossword puzzles the Gemma propaganda leaflet it recently dropped over the UK contained a puzzle when solved spelled out V1, the code name of a top secret cruise missile that would soon begin raining down on southern England. MI5 quickly tracked down the author or setter of the suspicious Daily Telegraph crosswords, one Leonard Dorr of Leatherhead in Surrey. Dorr was headmaster of Strand School in South London, whose staff and students had been evacuated to Effingham, Surrey during the Blitz. Dorr, a lifelong crossword enthusiast, had been setting the Daily Telegraph crossword since 1925 and would, over his lifetime, set an astonishing 5,000 puzzles for the paper. In early June 1944, days before the actual D-Day landings, MI5 brought in Dorr and his senior colleague, fellow crossword 
crossword compiler Melville Jones for questioning. As Tom Weston, a student at Dawes School, later recalled, an official looking car turned up. I was interested, so I kept watching. After a time, I saw Mr. Dawes go off in the car with whoever it was. We were astonished at the thought that Dawes was a traitor. He was a member of the local golf club. In a 1958 BBC television interview, Dorr described what happened next. They turned me inside out. They went to Bury St Edmunds, where my senior colleague Melville Jones was living. They put him through the grill as well. But in the end, they eventually decided not to shoot us after all. Had D-Day failed, I suppose they might have changed their minds. In the end, MI5 could find no evidence that Dorr was a traitor or that he was aware that these suspicious crossword clues were military code words. He and Jones were duly released and faced no further government action, though Dawes was very nearly dismissed from his post as headmaster. Operation Overlord, of course, achieved complete surprise, paving the way for the eventual Allied victory less than a year later. With no security breach found, the Daily Telegraph crossword clues were written off as just a coincidence, just one of history's strange flukes. Case closed. Or was it? In 2004, as part of the commemorations marking the 60th anniversary of the D-Day landings, the story of the Daily Telegraph crossword clues were widely published, prompting Richard Wallington, a former student at Strand School, to write into the website Historic UK and fill out the rest of the story. Mr. Dorr was a compiler of puzzles for the Daily Telegraph, and it was often his practice to call in sixth formers and ask them for words for inclusion. At that time, the US forces were liberally strewn throughout Surrey, particularly in the Epsom area, and there is no doubt the boys heard these code words being bandied about and innocently passed them on. I should know, as I was then a sixth former there myself, although not involved with this particular matter. Indeed, a prior publication of the story in the Daily Telegraph in 1984, the 40th anniversary of D-Day, had prompted another of Dawes' former students, Ronald French, to come forward with his confession. Soon after D-Day, Dawes sent for me and asked me point blank where I had gotten those words from. I told him all I knew. Then he asked to see my notebooks. When he opened them, Dawes was horrified. Dawes screamed at me and said that my books must be burnt at once. I've never seen anyone so angry in my life. I was really scared, terrified of imprisonment. Mr. Dorr gave me a stern lecture about national security and made me swear that I would tell no one about the matter. He was very insistent on total secrecy. He made me swear on the Bible that I would tell no one about it. I've kept that oath until now. Thus, the alarming crossword clues were neither the work of spies nor merely an astonishing coincidence, but rather the handiwork of inquisitive schoolboys, a textbook demonstration of the often unexpected difficulties involved in maintaining military secrecy. Yet even this accepted explanation might not quite add up. This historian and author Richard Denham writes, In a country paranoid to the point of obsession where careless talk costs lives, how feasible is it that squaddies would have known about those codes, talked openly about them, and that schoolboys would have found the random names so compelling as to pass them on unwittingly to door. Whatever the case, the 1944 crossword panic lingered in the British consciousness for some time, especially among the staff at the Daily Telegraph. During the 40th anniversary D-Day celebrations in 1984, Telegraph editor Bill Deeds stumbled upon the crossword story. Alarmed by the 40-year-old scandal, he proceeded to instruct the editors to scour the crosswords printed before and during the 1982 Falklands War between the UK and Argentina for code words relating to that conflict. Thankfully, they found none, though one would hope that by 1982, spies would have found a better way to transmit secrets than via newspaper code words.